In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So, um, a couple of years ago, I was helping some friends move like into their, into their new house, and I was carrying something that was kind of awkward. I don't even remember, remember what it was, but I was carrying it down their basement stairs, and it was awkward enough to the point that I couldn't see my feet, and so I had to trust that my memory was accurate of how many steps there were. Well, long story short, my memory was not accurate. And for about three seconds, my entire being was out of control. Maybe you felt this. Um, I was like 100% unstable. I was off balance, had no idea if I was going to regain control. I didn't know how it was going to end. Now, we've probably all seen this happen to others, all right? Or, or you're watching those videos on your phone and you just can't stop watching. But when it's happening to you, it is terrifying, truly, and even troubling a bit. Now this makes me think of Jesus's comment in our gospel passage tonight. Now my soul is troubled. We don't typically watch those kinds of videos, do we? Like the times in life where you miss a step and your life circumstances are all off balance and you're stumbling, desperately trying to reach out for something, like anything, to try and steady yourself. Like we feel out of control and we don't know if how or when it's going to end. If you've been there, or maybe if you're there now, just mentally raise your hand. It's odd, because when it happens to someone carrying something downstairs, as long as nobody gets hurt, we laugh, and we might even say something like, oh man, I wish I'd gotten that on video. But when it happens to our soul, like we typically don't, want anyone to know that. When somebody says to us, hey, how you doing today? Most of us will smile, nod. I'm good. How about you? It's almost as if we believe that admitting that we have a troubled soul means that we're admitting weakness. Like we feel vulnerable, scared, embarrassed. We might even feel as though we're defective. The interesting thing, though, is that Jesus says that his soul is trouble, but then he follows it up by saying that his prayer should not be, Father, save me from this hour. Because as he says, this is why he came, to be in this hour. And yet, in two days' time, Jesus is going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he will pray these words, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. It's like even for Jesus, coming face to face with our own weakness, it can be horrifying. But I wonder if we're actually scared of weakness because we're addicted to strength and power. In our first reading from 1 Corinthians tonight, Paul talks about foolishness and weakness being the ways of God. Like, not power and wisdom, but foolishness and weakness. So perhaps weakness is the way that things happen in God's kingdom. What if the impossible becomes possible through weakness? I, mean, I have friends, you probably do too, who have suffered because of weakness around things like drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever. And all of them who have been through recovery have said that it took them admitting their weakness before they then had power over their addiction. My kids, when they were young, they put like uh, little tiny seeds in like those little Dixie cups and put some dirt on them, set them by the window. Those seeds were not powerful. They were weak, tiny little seeds. And yet, from that weakness, up sprouts strong plants that yield all kinds of fruit. So could weakness be a blessing. Jesus certainly seems to think so. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who weep and mourn. Blessed are the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the peacemakers. The central image of Christianity, as we all probably know, is the cross. It's an instrument of death, however, used by the Roman Empire upon which Jesus himself was crucified. 
But guess what? You will be hard pressed to find any image of Jesus either dying or dead on the cross that shows him flexing his muscles or displaying his power because he is shown for what he is in that moment. He is weak and abandoned. So maybe that's the way of Jesus, admitting our own weakness rather than hiding it, telling the world that we are powerless rather than trying to grasp it or gain it, allowing God to do the impossible. Amen. Where am I going? I, do I go here? Sure, you go in the middle. Do you want to? Here, I'll step back here so you can go by. And are we doing maskless for this part too? I don't know. Are we? Are, are we close enough? Are we? I don't know. Yeah, just the hair here? back. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. I think people can hear us better, right? Well, no, nobody commented yet, probably because we didn't like it. <laughs> Because it's not the topic we want. We, we want more of this. Give me, give me abs, you know? Right. We, we put abs on Jesus on the cross because yeah. we're uncomfortable showing Jesus with, you know, a little, a little spare right. tire. And I don't know, maybe Jesus was truly, like, buff? A, a, a truly buff guy. I mean, he was a carpenter. You know, he probably worked and, and, and stuff like that, but... We, we don't like to think of Jesus as weak, and yet <laughs> he was killed in a backwater province of the Roman Empire, you know, so. I, I'm always haunted by Paul's mm. way of expressing this when he says God's power is made perfect in weakness. I like control too much. Mm. The, the upside down nature of it is what's disturbing. Um, like it, cause it, it completely flies in the face of everything, at least that I was told when I was a kid, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, work hard and you'll get ahead in this world, you know, display some strength. If I show weakness, well, now I'm gonna get walked all over. So, I don't know. I like, I like the concept of weakness though. I appreciate it, especially as we have been going through our readings for Holy Week. You know, there's, there's the reading tonight. There's our reading tomorrow. You know, Jesus taught, wash each other's feet, mm. serve each other, be a servant like I am. Like, none of those things are, like, what I would consider, like, traditionally strong. And still, those are the last lessons that Jesus taught his followers. Like, you know, when you think about, like, what am I going to teach? Like, I'm on my deathbed, and what am I going to teach my kids? What do I want my last words to be? Mm. And, you know, for Jesus, it was you know, serve each other, love each other. It's... When, when did serving become not a strength position? You know, I think for some people, they, they believe it is, but I think a lot of times it gets, you're going you're gonna to serve food in a soup kitchen, you're never going to make any money that mm -hmm. way. You know, you're, you're not going to get ahead in this world by, you know, serving. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't know, I don't know when that changed at I some point. I think it's always been, though, because I don't think Jesus would have taught be a servant if it would have been, like, a cool thing to be a servant. That's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always been. Um, and it's always been, the Bible's always been counter to that power. Jesus hung out with who? Sinners. Yep. Sinners, women, blind people. Lepers. Hungry people, yep. sick people, homeless people, tax collectors. And the prophets confronted the sin of not taking care of the poor, mm -hmm. the widows, the orphans, and the refugees. It's, it's always been, God's always been counter to our version of power, I think. Those on the underside of power, mm -hmm. those who are oppressed, God always hears those cries. But I think that maybe we have a hard time with it, be not because, well, I don't know why, but we don't want to put ourselves into that vulnerable position. And so we tend to not have patience, I think, 
for anybody else being in that vulnerable position. There must be something wrong with you if you're in that vulnerable position. I'm not going to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I need to take up with you. It's something I need to take up with the one who calls me to trust, not flex. I'm certainly glad that God doesn't look at me and says there's something wrong with me and that's why you're in that position and then chooses to not forgive me. You know, like grace abounds through that. Um, it is because of my weakness that God's grace saves me and pulls me out of that. So. And then I wonder too a little bit, do we, do we, like I was thinking of your illustration of, hey, how are you doing? You know, I can't tell you every single conference call I start during the day, hi, how are you doing? Oh yeah, yeah. Doing great. Living the dream. Like no one's telling the truth, but you say that you're doing great. Right. And I wonder if we're so bad at being vulnerable with each other because we're not very good at being vul vulnerable with God. Like, God, I don't want to admit that I'm struggling. I don't want to admit that I have doubt. I don't want to admit these things that are hurting me. And so I'm not going to admit it to anyone else no. either. No. Well, we're willing to hear somebody's not doing good once. But if they're not doing good twice, oh, come on. I don't have the time. You know, right? I mean, that's, and, that's and I, think, I, I think we all kind of know that. And we also know that we don't get better saying it once. It's just, yeah. God's patient. It's hard for me. Me too. Good sermon. Thank you. Father Aaron, that's what I heard right here. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank you.